Hello, everyone. Welcome to Therapy Dog Talk. My name is Sherry, and my dog's name is Sunny, and I am training her to be a therapy dog. Today, we are joined by a team that I met recently, not offline, but really looking forward to hearing their experience as a therapy dog team. Hey, Charlene. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on tonight. Yeah, of course. It's so wild. It looks like it's dark there and it's very much dark. Uh, it is dark here. I have my TV on a YouTube video of white screen, just hoping that that <laughs> would give me a little bit of good light in here because I'm a photographer by trade. So having icky light was not an option tonight. But uh, yeah, it's 7 p.m. here. So nice, nice. And is that is that puppy gray up on the wall? Yes, it now? is. I figured that would make a better backdrop than my office, which is where I was thinking originally of sticking up tonight. But he was a cute little guy. So we'll keep him back there. I love it. Well, for those who don't know you, would you like to introduce yourself in your pup? Yeah, so I am Charlene. Gray is asleep right now, but he is a two-year-old Great Dane. We are located in the Pittsburgh, PA area, and we have been a therapy dog team with Alliance of Therapy Dogs for just over a year. We got certified late last February, and we started visiting last March. Okay, wow. And you just recently wrapped up your 200th visit, yeah? We did. We're at about, I think, 225 or so. Okay. I keep really busy with the schedule. I'm self-employed, as I mentioned, so I'm able to kind of make my schedule late night hours to make up for all of the time that I'm out of the office during the day, but we do a lot of visits during the weekdays. Yeah, for sure. So you're a photographer. How did you end up finding out about therapy dogs? So actually, I'm, I'm not sure where I got the original idea to get into this. Years ago, whenever I was in college, I did a lot of volunteer work just with schools and I have a degree in early childhood education. So that kind of came into play with my volunteer work then. I, on a personal basis, hadn't interacted with a therapy dog since I was in preschool. I have had clients over the years that have therapy dogs now, but when I was in college, I'm not sure where I got that idea, but I wanted a Great Dane and I knew that they had wonderful disposition and temperament was supposed to be everything that a therapy dog should be. And so I got a great day whenever I was 20 and he did not have the temperament to be a therapy dog. So I had to put my dream of that on hold for a decade and he was wonderful. He was the best worst dog in the world, but he definitely was not shareable as Gray is. So yeah, originally I had no idea, but I've wanted to do this kind of work with a great Dane for as long as I can remember. Okay. Why Great Dean? What stood out to them for you? I don't have a great answer for that either. I grew up with the Black Labs and we had a lab whenever I was about 11 years and we brought home as a puppy and he was a big dog for a lab. He was about 100 pounds, like all muscle, not overweight. He was just big for a lab. And I just like always wished he was bigger. We were at an event, my family and I, probably a couple years after that, I was maybe 12 or 13. And we ran into two Great Danes and I just fell in love with them. And I begged my mom for the rest of my time at home, like, please, can we get a Great Dane? And she was never on board with it. So as soon as I was out of the house and able to get one myself, I did. And I brought Emmett home whenever I was 20. And I just lost him January of 2020. And I brought Gray home three weeks later. So your first one was named, sorry, what was it? Emmett. Emmett, yep. (laughs) <laughs> Emmett and now you have Gray. Okay. Yeah, and Gray is actually named after Emmett. Emmett was Gray in color mostly, so that's where I got his name, a little nod to him. I actually thought of that name for him whenever Emmett was about three. I think that I knew that I wasn't able to get another dog because Emmett was not dog friendly, and I knew I couldn't have two of them, and I wished that I did at the time. Although now I don't have any interest in having a second one. I like our dynamic and the way that we can pick up and go. I can take him everywhere, and I can't imagine... Changing our dynamic, first of all, between the two of us, our relationship, but also leaving him at home to take a puppy to training or leaving a puppy at home to take Gray to his therapy visits. I don't want to be outnumbered. So I think that it'll just be me and Gray for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I've talked about that with a few friends because like on the one hand, I know how much Sunny loves playing with other dogs. Yeah, great. But on the other (laughs) hand, like her world would shrink so much if I got a second dog because you have to decide who goes with you. Exactly. I mean, Gray's a little bit bigger than Sunny, especially (laughs) with a giant blue dog. I mean, I guess if they were well behaved enough, like if I had two of Gray, maybe I could make it happen, but not in the way that he gets to experience life. That's for sure. Yeah, it would just be a totally different relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it about Emmett that you knew would not make a good therapy dog? Oh, my goodness. He was a nightmare. So he was my best friend in the entire world. Love of my life. My heart dog for sure. He taught me more than I ever would have ever learned about dogs in general because he was awful. (laughs) 
<laughs> he was wonderful as a puppy. He was really easy puppy, actually, compared to Gray. I always say that I had a really easy puppy and a difficult adult dog last time. And okay. the universe flip flopped that for me this time. So I got what I was <laughs> due. Gray was a nightmare of a puppy, but he's perfect now. And he was worth all of the work that I put into him. <laughs> but Emmett was very fearful his whole entire life. And he started being reactive when he was probably about maybe maybe 13 months old or so. I ended up neutering him a little bit earlier than I planned because he was a little bit rough with boy dogs. And I was like, okay, maybe it's just a hormonal thing. So I neutered him at 13 months, which I had planned on waiting until at least 18 months. Gray is two and he's not neutered yet. That's a giant breed thing. If anybody wants to talk to me about that, I'm glad to jump on a soapbox for it. But yeah, I started experiencing issues with him and his reactivity in a pretty young age. At first, it was just other dogs. And then it was like, we couldn't go through a drive through He would start barking and snapping at the person at the other side of the drive through mm-hmm. um, Toll roads became a nightmare because nothing was digitalized then. So we were having to stop and pay people. And I'm like, my dog's going to bite your hand. Take this money. I have to go. Um, mm-hmm. So it was like a protective of the car thing at first. And then it just got to be everywhere and everything. I remember we went to the lake with him and we were like on the beach in October because we would specifically take trips on off-peak season times so that we wouldn't run into other people. And there was a woman like down at the other side of the beach and she was like, oh my gosh, I want to pet him. And she's like running towards us. And I'm screaming like, no, you can't come near him. So he was just not good with other people after some time. Start, like I said, started with dogs, then other people. He loved kids. That was his only like constant. And okay. I think for his whole life, it was just a fear thing. It was, okay, yeah. I can't trust this person. But if they're smaller than I am, then I'm not intimidated by them. Yeah. So he had what I called his fave five. It was myself, my parents, people that he had met and encountered a lot of times um, Mm -hmm. that he was really good with and he was wonderful. And I mean, arguably the perfect dog in a lot of situations, but definitely not shareable. So it was just very painfully obvious from the get go. We tried training through it. Like I said, I learned so much working with him because he was so much work. He had digestive issues since he was a baby as well. So in every way that he could have been, he was a learning experience for me, which I mean, I'm grateful for now because I mean, Gray's perfect and he's my second (laughs) pancake and I'm really, really proud of him. And the fact that I created him to be, I mean, his braider is incredible and she gave him such like a wonderful building block to have the perfect dog. But I am really proud of the fact that I did this and he's so awesome because of the time I was able to put in and the knowledge I had from everything I learned from my first pancake. (laughs) Yeah. The dog training world that I'm in, they refer to reactive dogs as naughty but nice. And it really is because it comes down to that fear, right? It's not that they want to be that way. It's that they're so scared that that's And and it was a very sweet dog, but he was just always afraid of life itself. Yeah. But those are the dogs that you learn the most about dog training. (laughs) True ones. Definitely. Perfect second pancake, thanks to Emmett entirely. Yeah. So you got great knowing that you wanted him to be a therapy dog. Yes. When did you feel like you could exhale, I guess, and accept the fact that that was going to be his path for So I don't think I ever gave any thought to an alternative that was gray. Um, This had been 10 years in the making. I was like certain this time and I was just going to make it happen. I will say that the only pause I feel like I did have was the week leading up to bringing him home. So I lost Emmett January 12th of 2020. And I immediately started looking for puppies because I was like, I cannot be in this house by myself. I have a cat. She's a cat. Um, I cannot not have a dog. I'm not that person. So the breeder that I had had my eye on for about a decade, knowing like, okay, I want a fawn next. This is what I'm going to get. She wasn't having puppies until the fall. And I really strongly considered waiting. I was like, okay, it's not meant to be yet. I'm just going to wait. I actually considered getting a smaller dog as well because I like to paddleboard and I was thinking, okay, I'll get a little dog now and I'll get a Dane in the fall. When presented with the opportunity to bring home a puppy, it's never going to not be a Dane for me. And that's when I realized that. Yes. But I found this incredible breeder, our raw food supplier, who's in Indiana. So she's like halfway across the country from me. She recommended our breeder, who is Misha Wilkinson out of Venetia, PA. She's WRS grade Danes. She's absolutely incredible. And my raw food supplier said, hey, this lady has puppies on the ground. She's phenomenal. She was recommended by someone I trust dearly and she's in your state. Pennsylvania is a a wide state. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have like a six or seven hour drive to go pick up a puppy, but that's fine. It turns out she's an hour south of me, which was great because I could go meet him before I brought him home and Look at your cute little one back there. I'm I'm trying to bribe her to be on camera. It's sort of working. He's crying and it's great right now. Probably to get him out here at some point. But I visited him. I can't remember what day it was on. Maybe Friday. And I was going to bring him home like the following like Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that. That weekend that I was preparing, going through all of them, it's toys, seeing what's worthy of being hand-me-downs, making sure I'm prepared to bring a puppy home. I was panicked and I was like bawling the whole entire weekend. I mean, I had just lost my best friend. So I was a ball of emotion anyway. 
But I was really, really worried, like, am I ready to do this? Can I make him into what I need him to be? And am I going to screw him up? And I was so terrified that I was going to mess this dog up. He was the last one left. And I initially wanted a girl because I wanted the opposite of Emmett since Emmett was such a pro child. And so I was looking for a fawn female and I had my heart set on that. And my mom was the one that convinced me the timing is right. The breeder is right. He's meant to be yours. Just get this dog. And Misha told me out of the seven puppies, Gray has the perfect temperament. He's going to be the perfect therapy dog. He's exactly what you need. And when we went to visit the litter about five days prior to bringing him home, he was. He was docile. He was laying on my lap, curled up in a ball. He was wonderful. All the puppies were wild and crazy. And Gray was just laying and snoozing with me and snuggly and sweet. And that was a trick because he was, like I said, terrible as a puppy. (laughs) I mean, it is absolutely every bit of who he is now. But, oh my goodness, puppyhood was rough with him. I knew, though, all along while I was training him through puppyhood that he would be perfect at this job because in public, anywhere we would go, we'd leave the house. He was a perfect gentleman. He was wonderful. And then we'd get home and he was hell on wheels. So I think throughout all of that, I left the house every single day of his puppy life because I was like, we need to go somewhere and you need to get tired. We have to get out of the house because that's when you're good and that's what makes you tired to sleep at home. From day one, though, it was very evident that he was going to be really, really good at being a therapy dog. He's so personable. He's the sweetest, happiest. Like Emmett was just really grumpy all the time. And he was, again, a wonderful dog. I loved him to pieces and he was everything I needed throughout my 20s. But he was always just like grumbling about something and (laughs) just a grumpy dog in general and super sweet, but not the happiest guy all the time. And Gray has literally never been unhappy. We'll go to memory care facilities where a patient will smack him across the face and say, get out of my face. And Gray's just like, oh, oh, okay, what's wrong with you? We're best friends, right? If you punched Gray square in the face, he would just be like, hey, what did you have for? What's the matter? (laughs) So he's got the perfect disposition to do this. That's really great. Did anything surprise you in your training journey with him? With training, not so much. During our first few therapy dog visits is where I was a little bit surprised because, as I mentioned, I had taken him places every single day. I got him about six weeks before COVID started. So we had six weeks of in-person like training classes, obedience with other dogs around, and we did lots of socialization in stores. I had made a Facebook post like, hey, friends who have kids, friends who have other dogs. I made sure that every dog was going to be super, super dog friendly because I still kind of have like PTSD from Emmett and issues with other dogs. So I admittedly to this day don't really bring Gray around other dogs because he's big and friendly and he scares other dogs and they come at him in an aggressive way or a defensive way. And I don't want him to ever have a bad experience. So socializing him, I was really, really careful about how we did things, that everything was positive, that everything was a good experience, and that he literally experienced everything. So he met kids of all ages. He was in crowds. We did all kinds of things with him. We did Black Lives Matter events. I took him to like big crowds and he was within probably 400 people, masked, of course, the middle of last summer or two summers ago and it was like nine million degrees outside and he was perfect. Our first probably months of therapy dog work, especially our first visit though, I was shocked to find that he was really apprehensive about certain things. And I was like, come on, you've done everything. You've been everywhere. Why are you nervous? (laughs) What is there to be scared of? So we had done training with walkers and wheelchairs, getting him used to those kinds of things that he would encounter in a facility. And whenever we went to our first facility, I know Diana was on here earlier, our activities director for the facility that we visited first, and we still go there. She saw firsthand how nervous he was to go anywhere near a walker that was too close to a wall or if there was a passageway created by a walker in a wheelchair, if a wheelchair was near a bed and he would just be like, oh, I can't fit there. There's no way. So yeah, Gray was more nervous than I expected him to be with the fact that he had experienced everything. I put him in front of everything and everyone and every experience I could have put him into. And he still was a little bit nervous at times. And I was really shocked by that. I guess just because I thought, okay, I did the perfect thing. I did everything I was supposed to do. And this is just going to be easy. And it wasn't as easy at first as I would have expected. But he did get used to things really quickly. For example, there's a daycare that we've been visiting since early last June. He loves kids, adores them, is excited to meet anyone and everyone. And at first when we were there, If two kids would be near him petting him and someone across the room dumped a container of blocks and it made a noise, he would jump out of his skin. We've been going there every two weeks for the past almost year. And now in that kind of situation, he doesn't even blink, doesn't bother him. Nothing phases him. We'll be in facilities with alarms going off and things like that. So lots of sounds and I guess different situations we've had abrasive 
residents and nursing homes. There was a woman actually running down the hallway, smearing poop on someone. I had to get gray out of that situation because things like that happen when you're visiting facilities in the wild here. But situations like that do not phase gray. And so I think, like I said, the biggest surprise for me was at first they kind of did. So getting him totally bomb proof took a little more time than I expected actually in the field once we actually started our therapy dog work. But the training process, I feel like I just exposed him to everything I possibly could. Yeah. And I love how you pointed out that you made sure that those socialization experiences he had were going to be really positive. Yes. <laughs> because I think a lot of times people think, I'm going to expose my dog to as many things as I can. Yeah, and forget him, but it was, <laughs> those are positive experiences. Right. And it actually creates a bigger issue than <laughs> not socializing your dog when you do that. Right. And I think that was part of the mistakes that I made with Emmett the first time around. And I think that he came to me, not to throw his breeder under the bus. She's not a backyard breeder. She's not the best breeder. She had dogs from decent quality lines and she showed them and everything. They were nothing to write home about. But whenever I was 20, my biggest concern was getting a breeder to take me seriously. I've never had a dog before. How are you going to let me take home a Great Dane on my own? I'm a 20-year-old girl. I just wanted to find a breeder that would trust me. Yeah. And I did ask her all the questions I thought I should be asking her. But a decade later, finding out all of the questions I really should have been asking, things like the puppy rearing and if they use the program such as, oh, what is that one called? Puppy culture. Uh -huh. um, I think that's what it's called. They're, they're basically starting them from birth to be socialized to lots of different things. And you're just continuing on that path. And those early socialization experiences are so much more important than people realize. And like you said, one bad experience can set your dog up for a fear for life. So I think Emmett came to me with a lot of fears already. His first days with the breeder, he was in a basement in the whelping box with a bunch of cages full of dogs barking and yelping mm. and all of that for eight straight weeks while he was there. And yeah. so I think that had a really big impact on his relationship with dogs later on. Those kinds of things, I feel like I wasn't exactly set up for success with him. But mm. also, we did dog parks. We did things that I would never even consider now. We don't set foot in a pet smart because I can't trust the people that are in there to have their dog properly socialized, properly restrained, comfortable with a giant Great Dane who may or may not want to approach them if they say it's okay. So we just kind of stay away from other dogs because I'm a little bit afraid of a bad experience happening, even at his age now. Yeah. Well, and if you go in those situations where you're feeling afraid, he's going to feel your fear anyway. So right. It yeah. <laughs> and that's been a learning thing for me too. Emmett was afraid of thunderstorms and our first thunderstorms whenever Gray came home, I was running around the yard with him like, we're not going to be afraid of this. We're going to be gone. <laughs> But I still, have that reaction the like, having a party. I still have that gut reaction though. Like if I see that the radar is getting bad, I'm panicked because I know my dog's going to be panicked. And then I'm like, oh, Gray's fine. Like I miss Emmett dearly every single day of my life. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think, oh, I wish I had more time with him. But the timing of everything, losing him and bringing Gray home was actually really perfect because of COVID and my senior day and it was nine and a half. And he was getting acupuncture every two weeks and chiropractic adjustments every four. So taking him into the vet with a muzzle was a process. And doing that in the time of COVID, whenever I had to send Lil Gray in to the vet all by himself, like that would not have flown with Emmett. So the timing of things was just really great. And I'm glad that I had Gray through the pandemic because we got so much more bonding time and training time. We did three trick dog titles by the time he was six months old. So wow. those were not necessary, of course, but I think they were really important to our relationship and bonding and the way that he is willing yeah. to listen to me at all turns because he knows that there's benefit to it, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And the tricks can come in handy, especially with volunteer therapy dog work. Yeah. It's oh, a lot of fun. People get a kick out of his tricks for sure. Yeah. What do you enjoy the most about therapy dog work? Honestly, sharing him with everyone is my favorite thing. I love his size and I love his people on a regular basis call Gray a specimen. He's stunning. He is exactly what his breed should be. He's beautiful. His head shape is amazing. He's very fit. Unlike his mom, I always tell people Gray eats the healthiest. He eats a raw diet. He gets salmon oil every day. So he has super soft fur. Like everything about him is phenomenal and beautiful. And he's just stunning. And so seeing people's reactions to him in the first place is really rewarding and just cool because I'm like, oh, yeah, he's mine. This amazing creature lives with me at my house. He's mine. Yeah. But also, obviously, his demeanor and the way that he impacts people is more so rewarding. To see somebody who hasn't tried to stand since they entered the facility that they live in and they try to stand because they want to greet Gray across the room, things like that. I'm an emotional human to begin with, but I cry 
probably once a week that Gray's mine and I'm just like really grateful for him and he's wonderful. But at a lot of experiences that we have with residents at nursing homes specifically, cancer patients at cancer treatment centers, we do hospitals. All of the visits that we have are places where people really, really need a smile. And whenever Gray can bring us to them, it's a rewarding thing on so many levels. I love that. I love that. Well, with 225 visits under your belt, <laughs> what advice do you have for someone who's interested in becoming a therapy dog team? So I guess first advice is just do it. Whenever I set out to do this, I had only ever heard of Therapy Dogs International. So I feel like anybody who's uh, watching this, whether it's now or watching it back later, they can watch it back later, right? Yeah. Anybody who's watching this is probably already a little bit well-versed in therapy dog life and what those options are. Again, I didn't really have a basis for it and knowing what I was getting into. And I had only ever heard of Therapy Dogs International, and that's where I was planning to certify him through. And I just did a random search for therapy dog teams or something, found a Facebook group that everyone was kind of touting Alliance of Therapy Dogs and kind of expressing the benefits of ATD over TDI. And I'm really, really glad we went that route. But also, they were testing dogs before I could have ever tested Gray through TDI because of COVID. So TDI kind of shut Mm -hmm. down. They weren't enrolling new people. They weren't doing testing or any of that. So Gray got certified at 14 months old, and I kind of regret not doing it at 12 months because I didn't realize that Alliance of Therapy Dogs existed until he was a little older. So as soon as we were able to get him certified, I began the process. I mean, obviously, socialization and training we talked about a little bit, especially just making sure all of those experiences are really positive and that your dog isn't going to end up fearful to anything. But as far as becoming a certified team, just get it going. Jump on Alliance of Therapy Dogs website. It's therapydogs.com. I'm going to be partial to them, even though there are other ones out there. I've heard good things about pet partners. There are tons of organizations. A lot of them are local in different areas, but Alliance of Therapy Dogs is nationwide. And I want to say, I think they're in what's it called Puerto Rico and maybe Canada as well. Could be. Could be. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Canada too. I should probably know that. I just recently became a tester observer with them as well. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of bring everything full circle because I really do want to be a resource to not only people who are aspiring to be therapy dog teams, but to people who are therapy dog teams to kind of take it up a notch. Um, We do a whole lot making our visits really impactful. I'm extra about everything. Gift giving is my favorite thing. So we went above and beyond for Christmas gifts for our residents at nursing homes, as well as the care staff. And I do little potograph cards of gray. So I have a little paw print beside his picture. And then on the back, there's some facts about him and a picture of him running because residents don't really get to see that side of him. He's got trading cards, of course, which is a normal like therapy dog thing. But he's got bookmarks for our library reading program. And I have stickers that say I read to gray today. So those take home things are, I think, the things that make a big impact and leave a lasting impression on people. Gray's got a website with coloring pages and a crossword puzzle and word search. So it's cool that everybody can enjoy Gray's visit, but also enjoy him after he's gone from the facility. Yeah. And that actually leads me into my next question, which is kind of how we met is through you have a Facebook group called I want to say over the top. Yes, it's dogs. over the top therapy dog teams. So do you want to tell us what that project? title of the group is super long because at the time we we're supposed to make your group name exactly what it is and be really descriptive. So it's over the top therapy dog teams. If you search that, you'll find it. I think the rest is making an impact with your pup. But that group, I guess I'm a person who likes a lot of projects and I always have way too much going on, as you can tell by 220 visits in a year. We had 200 in a year. I shouldn't overestimate (laughs) that. But I have a full-time business. I am nannying part-time right now because the pandemic has uh, hit me financially a little harder than planned. So I'm kind of trying to make up for some of that. So I have too much going on at any given time. I have an Etsy shop that I run and I have this great idea that I'm like, oh, I need to start some sort of a resource website for people who want to really go above and beyond as therapy dog teams because I love to do that and I would love to help other people do that. Initially, the idea started with in the Facebook groups that I was already in, people would say, oh, like, how are you finding places to volunteer, especially in light of the pandemic? And this was early last year as vaccines were just starting to roll out. I can't find anybody that will take us or we used to volunteer at this hospital and now we can't find anywhere. So I was giving out email templates to some people who had asked like, hey, how are you finding places to visit? So I was just giving like, hey, this is the email that I sent or here's like a phone script, kind of the same thing. And so what I would do is just jump on Google and search nursing homes near me. I would open literally 40 tabs of all of the different nursing homes, give everyone a call. Hey, who would I want to speak to if I'm looking to bring a therapy dog in to visit? Is that something you guys would be interested in? So a lot of times it was met with a lot of excitement, especially during the pandemic. Places that were allowing volunteers to visit hadn't heard from anyone in months and months or like their 
volunteers prior to the pandemic had stopped coming, whether they retired their dogs or if dogs had passed away or if people just weren't interested in kind of putting themselves at risk to go out in the pandemic for various reasons, of course. I feel like a lot of people lost their therapy dogs or didn't have any idea that that was a thing that we could do during the pandemic. So that was... I think a cool part of things, too, that Gray happened to start in the middle of the pandemic. I'm a little salty about it because the place that I've always dreamed of bringing him to is our children's hospital here in Pittsburgh. And that's like literally the reason I brought the guy home. I mean, I love Gray. I would have gotten him for any purpose either way. But Children's Hospital is incredible here. I do a lot of volunteer work there on a regular basis pre-COVID with my photography. So I'll do like the Santa photos. There's a nonprofit called Jameson's Army that works with heart patients. And I do photos for them whenever they have a special event or something. So those kinds of things I really love. Originally, I started off college thinking that I was going to be a pediatrician. Dropped my first bio class and that didn't happen. But I definitely wish that I was working in a hospital in some capacity. And so Children's Hospital especially just pulls at my heartstrings. And I've been dying to get gray into the doors. And I'm like, okay, pandemic, like this is what's not good about this. I mean, obviously so many bad things. About yeah. that, but for me, I really just want to get gray in a children's hospital. And we have gotten to do so many incredible visits. And I do think that he will be so much more prepared than if we had walked in day one into children's because there would have been obviously those same obstacles that we've encountered. Mm-hmm. And we've been able to kind of grow and handle those things as they've come up in other places. So when he gets into children's, he's going to be a real pro, of course. But the hardest part of him having started during a pandemic was we didn't get to pick and choose every single place that we wanted to go. We've gotten ourselves into some facilities that are a little bit strange. Like we went to one nursing home that was in a weird part of town. And I was surprised that it even had residents. And there were, I want to say maybe like 14 or so people there and they were all in this big cafeteria and everybody just stared at us when we walked in i was like hi guys i brought a therapy dog to visit today he's like not received well and i was like oh because i'm like i don't know what's going on i say we've had weird experiences i think that's the only one that comes to my mind we've had interesting little incidents at other places just last week actually a resident at a nursing home licked gray's cheek And that's something that comes along or a weird part of the job. But yeah, overall, we've had really, really good experiences, especially with it being during the pandemic, because so many people are extra excited to see a volunteer therapy dog gracing the halls. For example, we have a local ER here that is obsessed with Gray and they request to the volunteer coordinator, when can the Great Dane come? Because he's the only (laughs) Great Dane. I think locally, he might be one of the only ones that's well known, at least, because we know of a lot of the therapy dogs in the area that are sought after and have a reputation. And I haven't heard of anybody else with a Dane that is well-known around here. So it's nice to be the one with the cool great Dane. I love it. Well, is there anything else that you want to share while you're here? So I kind of sort of do. You know that I've been working on a resource website as an expansion on that Over the Top Therapy Dogs team, Facebook group. And I have this website that I'm working on. It's called Therapy Dog Life. It's therapydoglife.com. It is not finished. So my plan was to have it done before this Instagram Live. We kind of set this deadline a month ago. And she's like, okay, you're going to have this ready. It's going to be fine. We're going to do it for this date. And I'm like, yes, that's perfect. It'll give me a deadline. This is the date. And those of you who are watching that know me know that that's not exactly exactly how I work. So I get too many projects. I have way too much going on, but I do have the website. It's reasonable if you jump on there. There are some things on there. Like I use the website template. So the template, there's a few pages that'll be like, hi, I'm Josephine. And that's just the website template. I'm not Josephine. I think that Gray and I are introduced in a couple different spots. So there are definitely some flips on the website that are like, no, oh, this is not ready. This is not a completed project, but that will be growing and improving as time goes on. And eventually I would love to start some sort of a membership to, again, kind of provide resources to anybody who's aspiring to be a therapy dog team, but but also aspiring to be the best therapy dog team because it's so much more rewarding the more that you put into it. Totally. Yeah. I hope that we have the ability to work together on more projects down the road because yeah, I think we have a lot, of, a lot of great ideas together. It sounds great. Yeah. That I so appreciate you again having me on here tonight. I'm not a public speaker, so I've been really anxious about this since we set it up, but that's a good TV light. So at least there's that. <laughs> no, you did great. Don't even worry about it. And if anyone wants to follow you in gray, it's gray, G R E. G R E Y underscore the Great Dane. Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. Give Gray a hug for us. All right. Will do. I think he fell back asleep. He's been quiet for a while now. He's like really regimented, kind of like a toddler. That's how we figured out that puppyhood thing. He just needed more sleep. So it turns out he's not a nightmare. He's just was tired. So he has to better sleep. 18 Uh, hours a day, I think. So I get it. (laughs) Well, Gray, actually, I want to say he would sit closer to 20. He's really only awake for the hours that we have to be places. Other than that, he's a snoozer. Yeah, that's very familiar. (laughs) All right. Well, take care and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Bye, Bye, Sonny. (laughs) Her back there. She's so cute.